And um, I would say that in the Enlightenment tradition, the art museum had you know, been, been envisioned as a temple of learning, where the individual was to be introduced and invited to an aesthetic discourse, and through that aesthetic discourse was to take part in the formation of a public sphere, if you want to follow Jürgen Habermas, uh, that he, um, you know, presented or described as the hallmark and precondition of a democratic society. What Lisitsky had in mind in his abstract cabinet goes beyond this enlightenment notion of the museum. It is a direct invitation for the visitor to take action mentally and physically. So um, what appears actually quite static here is it was actually a really a dynamic proto-interactive apparatus with mobile parts that uh, presuppose the presence and agency of the visitor. And actually, Lisinski was very aware of the importance of exhibition design for his whole work. In 1926, he, uh, um, in 1926, he commented in his diary, my most important work as an artist begins the creation of exhibitions. There are many more examples of avant-garde artists who really, you know, dived into the possibilities of what architectural, um, architectural displays or, you know, exhibition architecture could do uh, to change our perception of space and our perception, perception of the outside world. I'm showing you here the very famous um, uh, drawing by uh, the Austrian artist um, and typographer Herbert Bayer, the field of vision diagram, where he really, you know, tries to come away from this very, you know, static notion of the art museum as basically a sequence of of of, um, of paintings to something that 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 has really a spatial quality that engulfs us in a way. This is sort of a scaled down version of one of Herbert Bayer's installations at the Museum of Modern Art in 1942. And then another example I wanted to show you, also very famous, Frederick Kiesler, another Austrian architect. Austria is apparently quite um, avant-garde uh, for, for this kind of um, material. His installation of Peggy Guggenheim's um, um, you know, gallery in New York in 1942. Uh, where you can see that you know the, the 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 gallery space is sort of transformed into a tunnel again, sort of you know really architecturizing the um, the exhibition interior. Now to the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I sort of would like to uh, present five you know a, a, a short overview of the uh, history of architectural exhibitions at MoMA, but not so much historical rather than typological, and I propose to uh, might make five different distinctions from the white cube of the black box, the houses exhibit, the exhibition as critique of this ballet practice, and finally exhibition as research and process. The first category, uh, the white cube, and I would like to start with um, the very famous 1932 exhibition, Modern Architecture, international exhibition that was uh, staged by Philip Johnson, who was at the same time the first director of MoMA's Department of Architecture. This exhibition in 1932 um, also marked the foundation of the Department of Architecture at MoMA, and uh, certainly together with the accompanying uh, publication, the international style, it really became one of those mytholo mythological moments, or uh, you know, it arrived sort of at a cult status, one could even say, for modern architecture in the following de decades. And especially, of course, the term international style um, has been applied ever since to basically, you know, modernist architecture as a style as opposed to a social movement. Um, here, um, I would like to not so much discuss about the importance of this exhibition as a historical factor, but really about what actually was on view and how it was presented. Here is another uh, installation view. So what can we see here? Um, the installation uh, view I'm showing here uh, actually reveals a surprisingly conventional exhibition designs. A series of black and white photographs is presented against the neutral background uh, of white gallery walls, which you can see here very well. This is actually um, in, was shown in a, in a townhouse that the Museum of Modern Art back in the early 1930s rented. The, the, the building, uh, the museum building, actually only you know was was uh, inaugurated in 1939. So these are still sort of um, sort of. Um, pop-up, this is sort of a pop-up museum, uh, one could say, where this exhibition took place. 
So these uh, photos along the walls um, uh, are unframed and seem to float against the wall. Presentation mode is mirrored in the gallery space where architectural models are presented on pedestals uh, as singular objects completely devoid of their urban and cultural context, really as sort of, you know, almost as sculptures they are presented. Uh, only with the exception that in the foreground you can see here, uh, there's a little, um, there's a, there's a little um, room, um, floor plan uh, for each for each of these uh, objects. So uh, basically, to invite you know professional audience architects in particular to also you know study more precisely what is on view. I do want to say, however, as conventional as this looks from, from today's perspective, that back in the 1930s to actually use architectural models in an architecture exhibition was actually quite new. Uh, as you're, of course, all aware, in the 19th century, in the Beaux-Arts tradition, um, you know, the primary um, medium of representation of architects was, of course, the architectural drawing. Just show you here a random example of, uh, of, a, of an unknown uh, American architect, uh, you know, um, working in this Beaux Arts tradition, and uh, you know, architecture in the Beaux Arts tradition was very much about its two-dimensional represent representation, and that the idea that architecture was actually about space, which is so self-evident for us nowadays, was actually really only introduced into architectural discourse at the late 19th century through figures like August Schmarsdorf and Heinrich Wölfling, and so on in you know basically German art history of the late 19th century. And it was this notion of space as you know the primary problem of modern architecture that actually led to what we could call a model boom, uh, which then led to the representation of architectural models in modernity, or uh, of the establishment of the architectural uh, model as one of the prime mediums of architectural representation in modernity. So this is actually not as conventional, um, historically speaking, as it may look uh, for us today. As much as the exhibition Modern Architecture attempted to popularize the modern movement, or be better, its aesthetic, its style, as little did it do justice to the socio-political project of the modern movement. By isolating the models and representing them outside of their urban and social context, they become depoliticized and aestheticized object. And of course, uh, I want to remind you of the whole discourse on the White Cube. Uh, Brian O'Doherty, a um, uh, critic um, who was uh, writing his famous treatise Inside the White Cube in 1976, very much, very much uh, critiques, you know, the White Cube, this uh, what had been seen as sort of the neutral exhibition space was actually highly charged with institutional power and um, also with the power to depoliticize artistic movements and architectural movements um, as well. Nevertheless, as we can see uh, from the international exhibition as well as from many later examples, this form of display displaying became a powerful model for the display of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art. And I'm just showing you two, uh, two random examples. Here an, uh, an exhibition on the architecture of Eric Mendelssohn from 1942, which you know basically follows that that model. However, not using any models, but just really uh, only using uh, photographic representations. Another example, uh, Louis Kahn from 1966. You can see here, and um, there are, um, you know, you see, you see these very famous uh, traffic studies as well as urbanistic projects. So in a way, there is a certain social context here. If you look at the models in the foreground, they're really mass models. They're really about sort of the cultural appear, uh, the, 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 the sculptural quality um, of these objects. So um, one could say that um, the white cube, even though it may not appear really um, very um, adequate for the representation of architecture in the sense of architecture as also having a social and a political side always attached to it, it was really actually you know, firmly established through the Museum of Modern Art and Health's way for many decades to come. Which brings me to the second category, which uh, in many ways could be understood as a counterpoint to the white cube model that we have just discussed. And I would like to, to illustrate this with another early exhibition from the Department of Architecture at MoMA. 
um, namely the exhibition America Can Tough Housing that was shown uh, in 1934. Um, and it is immediately evident that this exhibition provided an intellectual and formal counterpoint to the international style exhibition of just two years before. Although one of the sections of that initial show, the international style, had also been concerned with housing, the topic really here reached a limelight in the 1934 exhibition. And um, I should only say that given the US American uh, context, you know, very highly capitalist society with very low uh, sort of level of um, state influence on, 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 on questions of cultural affairs, but also on uh, issues such as housing, um, the exhibition's postulate for state funded social housing was surprisingly articulate. One could even say activist, featuring a clear political agenda. And of course, it's 1934, it's five years after the big you know, crash of 1929 and the, the time of the New Deal. So we have this um, stronger interventionist uh, policy in the United States than perhaps ever before uh, in, in its history. Um, the MoMA exhibition explicitly pointed to the existence of slum tenements in the museum's close proximity in Manhattan and asked that they be replaced by modern apartments with higher living standards even for the unprivileged and the working class. It should be mentioned that America Can't Have Housing was by no means a singular episode in the museum's commitment to address issues of social or political relevance. When the museum moved into its new building in 1939, as already mentioned, the architecture exhibition uh, shown on that uh, occasion was devoted to the topic of house, houses and housing. I'm showing here, you hear another installation view. And then in 1942, we had another um, um, exhibition that addressed uh, at this time the question of wartime housing and how you know the um, the, the returning soldiers from the war should actually you know be housed um, after the war. Um, and I would also, um, here is actually another um, exhibition, um, uh, installation of that very same exhibition. So there is a very firmly established um, sort of um, tradition to address uh, issues such as housing and um, you know the political side um, of, of architectural problems. And um, this is actually something I'm interested in doing as well. We are um, doing in the, in the exhibition, an exhi in the fall, an exhibition on um, the refugee crisis in Europe and elsewhere. I'm showing you here um, uh, an image of um, um, a, Brit a Dutch um, artist who, you know, is interested in the spatial politics uh, that you know Europe's uh, sort of um, poly uh, increasingly strong. Um, um, you know, policy of erecting um, walls along its borders creates these absurd spaces such as here uh, in Northern Africa. Anyway, let's return to the historical precedent. In contrast to the cool white cube aesthetic of the international style, the housing exhibition from 1934 which you can see here again, addressed the visitor much more directly and forcefully. The exhibition was organized spatially as a circuit in which graphic elements such as arrows, very, which you can see very prominently here, gave the viewer direction um, and orientation. And um, also very importantly, text and image were um, you know, really combined to form a strong, convincing, powerful political uh, message to take action, especially here in New York City, as, mentioned, as I mentioned before. And also, interestingly, uh, this exhibition for the first time featured large-scale photo murals, very large blown-up photographs, very large photographies, for whose selection the acclaimed photographer Walker Evans was responsible. And it's, um, of course, not, not particularly surprising that MoMA would turn to photo murals at that time. They were all the rage, they were sort of the new medium of the 1930s. Um, they featured, for example, very prominently in the World Exposition in 1937. I'm showing you here the example of the Agriculture Pavilion um, in Paris, um, actually designed by Charlotte Perrion. Le Corbusier uh, used um, many photo murals in his, in his uh, own um, pavilion. Uh, in 1937 as well, and so did, for example, the famous Spanish pavilion by José Luis Sert, with you know where uh, Picasso's uh, Guernica was shown as a strong protest of public 
protest against the Franco uh, regime, which was supported by the fascists, uh, particularly the Nazis in Germany. Um, one of the earliest examples, however, for photomurals really on a large scale was again Eli Stitsky's um, installation of the Soviet pavilion in the, in the press exhibition in Cologne in 1928. And it is certainly not surprising in, that in this climate, uh, you know, MoMA would also try to experiment with photomurals. Um, the key object in this exhibition, however, was the reconstruction of three rooms of a recently demolished tenement apartment. And I can't show you any image, uh, unfortunately, because none of the photographs have survived. However, I think this is a very, very important moment, again, in the history of architectural exhibitions. So, um, what did this part of the exhibition show? It basically staged three rooms of a former apartment that had been torn down, um, including the personal belongings and the furniture of the previous inhabitants. And, you know, this hyper-realism, as I would call it, went so far even to, uh, to include cockroaches, living, you know, cockroaches, uh, which, however, were removed shortly after the exhibition opening because visitors were uh, complaining. Unfortunately, um, again, I can't show you any image, but um, the same uh, is also true for sort of the counterpart to that negative example of, you know, what housing for the poor in New York used to look like or looked like. Mo uh, MoMA staged um, sort of a model apartment, um, you know, in which, which included uh, modernist furniture. And of course, the point was that it was uh, possible to use through the um, advantages of industrial mass production and prefabrication and so on and so forth, you know, the, the myth of the modern movement, it was actually possible to replace, uh, you know, these tenements, these slums, with relatively affordable mass housing that was actually also, you know, uh, hygienic and followed a modern, you know, artistic and architectural style. What we find here, um, are, I think, traces of an aesthetic of immersion. Both the photomurals and the model apartments have in common that the aesthetic boundary between the object and view and the viewer, the subject that looks at the object, is potentially blurred. The audience is invited to immerse themselves into an artificially created environment. And of course, there is again historical precedent. I want to you know, point to the diorama of 19th century city, a very sort of popular medium that uh, prepared in a way uh, for the cinema. And I also want to point, of course, to the dioramas that um, Le Corbusier um, again used um, in, his, in his exhibition projects. Uh, for example, for his famous um, project for um, a city of three million inhabitants, um, which um, I'm showing you here. I'm not quite sure why you have this. It's, um, everybody's getting a little time, including Anyway, um, I just wanted to show you the, on the top this, um, this um, um, image. It's actually a historical image. Um, you have to imagine yourself like uh, looking through a little box inside the diorama, uh, you know, which gives you like gave you sort of like a panoramic overview. Again, this sort of you know immersive or you know um, um, highly staged uh, illusionistic approach to representing architecture. MoMA made use of this model um, as well. I'm showing you here an example of 1957 um, on an exhibition on building for big business and government where you see one of these dioramas you know, framing uh, one of the uh, curtain wall facades that were so, you know, such a hallmark of, of 1950s modernist. Uh, architecture, and in particular, of course, the Seagram building by Miss van der Rohe, which was just under construction. Anyway, given that MoMA is widely considered the standard of bear of the white cube, as I had uh, previously um, discussed, it is interesting to find that, an institution, that the institution experimented with such immersive display practices even in its founding years. In the case of the America Can't Have Housing Exhibition, the, the aim was quite obviously to trigger political action by means of certain shock effect of the overwhelming, overwhelming realism of display. 
that said, I also want to point out another form of immersion that was also practiced very frequently at the museum, which was actually completely counter to any political activation. And, uh, and one of the prime examples I would like to show you here briefly is the exhibition Visionary Architecture from 1960, which really dealt with the architect of Frederick Kiesler. And um, the show basically evolved around the project of the Endless House, which you can see here, uh, you know, gloriously in light lit up and installed in a black room, so sort of, you know, completely, um, you know, floating uh, in the air as 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 as, as a sculptural, completely aestheticized um, object, uh, you know, uh, lit up through dramatic lighting. This is actually a pretty spectacular inversion of the institutional aesthetic of the white cube into its opposite. So instead of the white walls, the so-called neutral walls, we have now as basically a darkened cinema hall. Of course, you know, there's this whole discourse about the black box and the white cube one being sort of, um, you know, related to pop culture and the cinema and the white cube to high culture, the museum. And I think what this exhibition here in 1968, curated by Arthur Drexler, um, you know, he tried to sort of bring the black box with its, with its you know, high populist esteem into the temple of the white cube, which is well known. Anyway, um, I think um, I already mentioned that this has nothing to do um, with the political, you know, um, impetus of earlier exhibitions that experimented with other forms of immer Im immersion. But this is really about, you know, triggering or, ex um, you know, um, extrapolating the aesthetic effect of the objects on display. <coughs> Which brings me to the third category, the house as exhibit. Um, as a genre, the architectural exhibition obviously has the problem that it usually has to, uh, you know, deal with or um, with operate with representations as opposed to the objects themselves. So, unlike an art exhibition, which you know is usually the case in the Museum of Modern Art, where you can actually see the artistic objects, an architectural exhibition has the problem, but that usually have to work with media representing the architectural objects, such as you know films, drawings. And photographs and so on. Um, this dilemma is, of course, uh, you know, um, a problem up to today. And um, it's much more difficult to actually do an architectural exhibition than an art exhibition. I would say, and this is something that uh, Vladimir and I, who are co-curating a show. Uh, currently uh, on the architecture of former socialist Yugoslavia are, you know, dealing with every day. What do you actually show in an architectural exhibition since you cannot show the buildings themselves? Well, how has the museum done that in the past? It has actually built architect real buildings in its garden several times. And the first time it did it was in 1949, a model house for a single family, uh, which was erected in the sculpture garden next, you know, to the um, to the museum um, by Marcel Breuer, and I'm showing you here an exterior view. And the house came fully furnished uh, with, you know, furniture by Charles and Ray Eames, among other things, and also a modern plumbing system, as the um, as the press release stated, which is apparently back in 1940, still still not totally self-evident, which is also kind of surprising from a contemporary perspective. The purpose of the exhibition was quite obviously to advertise the blessings of modern architecture and design um, and to make them popular for a broader audience uh, and you know also to establish modern architecture as a, as a model for the ascending American middle classes and you know the, the baby boomers that were started to be born in these in these years after the war of you know rapid growth of, of, of affluence of a large you know percentage of the population. this uh, actually sort of a real house that could be lived in. It has this very strong stage effect, you know, people could peek through, it has something voyeuristic. Uh, the only thing missing is actually people uh, really living in there. But this, was, this is really about experience. This is about not so much teaching uh, an audience about, you know, architecture and, 
you know, as a, as a, as a science or a discipline, but really sort of giving uh, people a feeling or an experience of how it would be to live in a piece of modern architecture and of course um, with, the, with the hope that they would emulate it and go, go home and, and buy such a house. Um, and of course this is all the more you know, poignant because as you can see you know, American audience still relatively unfamiliar with modern architecture in the 1940s uh, you know, this stark contrast that uh, the Russell Royer's building, of course, forms against the background of the townhouses in Midtown, Manhattan, uh, from the late 19th centuries. However, um, I also want to point out that Russell Royer's house really isn't a house for the city. It takes up too much space. It's not very efficient space-wise, and if you are familiar, you know, with um, prices uh, for, you know, properties in New York, this is basically uh, impossible, and this was also basically possible back then. It's just not made for a very dense urban situation. This is really a suburban home, and uh, you know, through proposing a suburban home for everybody, of course, the house implicitly evokes the value systems of an American white middle class of the post war years. So there was dreaming of a family house in the suburbs, a dream that was in fact uh, you know turned into reality by the millions. Gener uh, um, generously funded by grants from the federal government for the returning, you know, from the soldiers, so the GI Bill that allowed them to build with very good conditions. And this mass, you know, this, this suburbanization, of course, led to an urban problem in the United States, it became known as the White Flight, which was, you know, partial, uh, partly at least motivated by racial politics. It resulted in a de facto segregation and downfall of American uh, inner cities in the decades to come, and this is a condition that many American cities uh, still actually struggle with in the present. And of course, I'm not saying that Breuer's house is responsible for all this, but it's just very interesting to see how, how such an object actually, you know, is indicative of an implicit political agenda for politics period. This kind of presentation was uh, tried out again, it was a big success, and in 1953 the MoMA uh, staged uh, a traditional Japanese house in the Museum Garden for a summer. This again was a super popular exhibition, and uh, at the same time it was very surprising because why would you show in a museum of modern art an, uh, you know, a traditional Japanese house that basically had nothing to do with, um, with uh, modern architecture, or did it? Yes, it did, as Arthur Drexler, you know, again, the curator, um, pointed out, uh, traditional Japanese architecture actually was proto-modernist in many ways, and as such a model for, you know, modern architecture, including you know, the skeleton framing uh, construction system, the use of mobile and flexible furniture, the asymmetric floor plan, and the close relationship between interior and exterior spaces, and also the lack of ornament. Um, and um, I also want to point out um, that this house um, was actually much more than just a presentation of a, you know, a, a structural concept of a, or a piece of architecture. This was really, really also about using architecture as a stage. It was used to, you know, for a Shinto ceremony, for concerts and so on and so forth. It really was about introducing an American Western society to a, you know, back in the 1950s, still a very unknown Oriental or you know, Eastern uh, society with a completely different you know, set of, of, of living. And of course, again, you know, the, the, the political context, of course, the Cold War and the role you know, the United States played in uh, Japan um, uh, after the war and you know, the Pax Americana. And I think this is also, also about uh, introducing to an American audience um, Japanese culture in this way. Um, and of course these uh, political connotations are also um, evidenced here um, in, a, in a minute showing the visit of the Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida in 1954. Anyway, um, so um, I would say this was this is kind of a performative architecture. One, one could call it. It's really not so much only about architecture, but it's about architecture as a stage uh, for co uh, cultural action. 
just two very brief uh, uh, notions of how architecture has really been built in the museum as well. Or, um, or often, obviously, the, the sculpture garden um, was used, um, spe specifically, if not for houses, that we have seen two examples of for engineering-driven roof structures, such as um, here, a first example, um, showing the work of the German architect engineer Frei Otto, which was uh, installed this um, uh, tent structure system uh, in the sculpture garden that sort of housed the exhibition underneath. And then again in 2000, um, you know, a vault, a paper arch by uh, Shigeru Bond that was installed in the sculpture garden. 2000. All of it showing that even though the museum is not really made for showing architecture as architecture, and um, it's actually possible and has been done. For the rest of my talk, I would like to focus on uh, two recent architectural models uh, of exhibitions. And I would like to introduce uh, two more categories of installations that, that seem to be uh, you know, relevant in this, um, in this uh, context. A number of more recent experimental installations have intended to address the mechanisms of viewing themselves in an exhibition in a museum and the role that architecture plays in, a, uh, in, in, in you know, framing uh, views and framing the gaze in an exhibition. In so doing, um, these exhibitions have addressed architecture's capacity to frame and direct the gaze. Um, these exhibitions are a critical comment on the practices of display in the museum, one could say, and as such they are a self-reflection on the medium of the exhibition. While not being architectural exhibitions in the strict sense of the term, these, uh, these shows did illustrate to what degree architecture and the spatial arts inform visual perception. The first example I would like to show you is an exhibition staged by the back then relatively unknown and uh, you know young and upcoming architects Elizabeth Stiller and Ricardo Scofidio who staged in 1989 a show Parasite um, in the museum. What did that exhibition consist of? Basically upon entering the museum as well as entering into or through a strategic thresholds and sites of transition, such as of course the entry door, the escalators and so on, visitors were filmed by means of cameras and these images were then projected in the gallery spaces in a fragmented manner. Inspired by 1970s performance art, this installation addressed the ambiguous role of the museum visitor as both an active agent, as somebody who actually moves through space and you know looks at art, and in the production of cultural meaning, and sorry, and as a pa passive buyer. So in a way, um, the the visitor by being filmed and then, by then becoming part of the display itself becomes sort of part of the installation or of the work of art itself. As curator Mathilda McQuaid stated in the exhibition brochure, quote, museum visitors are the performers in Parasite and activate the piece by their movement through the revolving and garden doors and on the escalator. Similarly, visitors to Parasite are voyeurs of museum activities and they watch others pass through the camera's field of vision. This, this dialectic of seeing and being seen that becomes the actual content of the exhibition. No longer concerned with architectural objects or their representation, the exhibition by Diller and Scofidio explored the conditions of viewing as well as the power structures implied by the gaze. Of course, they you know, related to some surrealist moments as well as these you know, upside-down um, uh, presentation here. A different way of critically intervening in the gallery space was presented by Herzog and Dumeron in their exhibition Perce Perception Restraint. And you already hear from the title Perception Restraint that this is again about critically you know, um, reviewing how objects become the object of perception in a museum. Uh, this show critically revisited the museum's collection and display policies and conventions. The traditional separation of the different artistic media in the museum, we have departments for painting and sculpture, for architecture and design, for drawings and prints and so on. So this you know, separation of the different media um, 
was replaced by a dense, integrated multimedia presentation that established surprising connections between the artistic media, such as you see here, design objects and sculpture, and painting, and so on and so forth. The architect, Herzog de Meuron, commented on this part of the installation, quote again, our project is an attempt to offer a spatial alternative to the existing galleries, a site of heightened concentration and density that functions like a kind of perception machine. By obstructing and putting pressure on perception, again, by obstructing and putting pressure on perception, the viewing experience is intensified and becomes more enduring, more selective and more individual. Then another space um, that was again sort of installed as a black box, again with uh, you know these sort of um, very surreal moments of having the, the screens with film material installed uh, on the ceiling, which made you know which basically obstructed our ways ways of seeing you know looking at a TV or looking at a, a, a video clip, and and you know through that process of actually obstructing our normal view or the, the, the way we should do it actually. You know, having the, the audience start to think about how architecture and you know how spatial operations actually strongly inform how we think of, um, about perception and about our everyday environment. The architect curators thus devised various ways in which to obstruct perception. Again, with this framing, you know, this pico, basically, again, sort of the, the idea of the diorama and through this obstruction to render conscious the conventions behind viewing. Needless to say, this strategy did not necessarily do service to the objects on view, and the exhibition became a subject of criticism for this reason. I have actually asked my, my uh, curator colleagues in the museum who were already, you know, but there, and they basically unanimous, unanimously hated the, the exhibition. So what architects think is successful or interesting is not necessarily shared by everyone, also something to keep in mind. However, as a, spa a spatial visual investigation into architecture's power to frame and direct the gaze of liberating and obstructing it, it was a very instructive exercise. The, the exhibition did raise the important question of how exhibition architecture and the display apparatus fundamentally condition our viewing experience. So to wrap up my um, typology, I would like to briefly discuss the fifth and last category of architectural exhibitions um, at MoMA. And this is basically um, the notion that the exhibition can document um, a research process rather than simply displaying objects, uh, finished, um, you know, outstanding artifacts of high aesthetic quality. This model has been experimented with under the rubric of issues in contemporary architecture for the past 10 years or so. One of, um, um, one of um, you know, the iterations of this was the exhibition Foreclosed, rehousing the American Dream. And I'm showing you here the final result of the exhibition, which is not really the point. This was, sh was shown to the larger audience. Um, what actually, um, here's another, um, um, of this series, Rising Currents, Project for New, Year's, uh, New York's Waterfront. So you see the one thing is very much again concerned with housing after the you know, Lehman Brothers crash in 2008 and the implications it had for a large number of Americans who, who lost their homes. Uh, so what could architecture do to remedy that? And the other one was um, preceding that, uh, the issue of climate change and its impact on the rising sea levels for port cities such as New York who, that would uh, or that will be underwater in uh, you know just a few decades if there are no solutions found. So um, all of this looks like con a very conventional you know exhibition again, but the whole point is that these exhibitions were only really the final mark of um, a whole um, a month, a several months long process. That in, uh, included, uh, you know, workshops in which visitors were invited to participate in design projects, and you know, and to start activating um, a discussion, a public discourse on these contemporary issues in architecture. And I'm showing you some, you know, images of these workshops that were organized. And this foregrounding of the research and design process allowed visitors a better understanding of the interdisciplinary nature and the team-oriented nature 
and of working in an architectural office that countered a widely held idea of architecture as being a discipline driven by single exceptional figures, mainly or exclusively concerned with formal issues. In the exhibition, the models in the exhibition model that sought to counter this perception, the final exhibition with some of the design solutions merely formed one aspect of the entire undertaking and perhaps not even the central one. Rather than providing a platform for exceptional formal solutions, the museum initiated the discourse and enabled critical uh, exchange between the exponents of the architectural professions on the one hand and the audience on the other. And that is actually something that I, um, you know, um, recognize time and again how important it is for uh, the architectural profession to reach out beyond its, its boundaries. I was, for example, at the architecture uh, biennial in Venice uh, a few weeks ago, and you know, it, 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 uh, it was very instructive and interesting, but it was also very interesting to see that, you know, there, were hardly, there was hardly anybody there who, who wasn't an architect. So, you know, if we have something to say as a profession, I think it's very important to, have to, to, to uh, allow the public, the audience, to engage and to, uh, you know, to, to, to become interested in the problems that architects think about on a daily basis. Uh, I could also mention the Young Architects program in this uh, context, which is basically an annual um, competition that we stage together with um, our contemporary partner, PS1 in Queens, um, where you know, we really give the chance of young architects uh, from North America to build their very first uh, project with a very modest budget, but with a very big you know, media presence, given that it's MoMA. This year's winner is um, Escobedo Solis Studio from Mexico City, completely unknown, which is uh, the whole point of the undertaking. And um, unlike in the former iterations of the Young Architects program, shown here just as an example, the winner of 2012, which is this very exuberant, you know, colorful installation, basically a sculpture. Escobedo Solis really, you know, did a very minimal installation and uh, through, you know, just very, very simple materials such as colored threads or, you know, the inclusion of, 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 a, of a water basin and its reflections on the wall sort of changed the atmosphere and the perception of the given space. So a, 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 a relatively, you know, at first sight, underwhelming, but, you know, kind of sensible um, way of dealing with um, a given, you know, spatial context. Which brings me to my conclusion. I have proposed a historical typography of architectural exhibitions at MoMA that indicate changing perceptions of how architecture should be presented and discussed in the context of an art museum. In general, it could be said that architectural exhibitions are situated between the task of educating non-professional audiences about matters of architecture, on the one hand, and providing an experience, on the other, be it the experience of the design process or of an architectural space. It is generally assumed that a historical vector leads from one, the education uh, pole, to the other, namely the experience, and that they are separated by the divide that we identify as a distinction between the modern and the postmodern. One of the obje objectives of my presentation was to illustrate that such a simple narrative does not do justice to the rich history of display practices at the Museum of Modern Art, which already experimented at an early stage with theatrical and proto-immersive forms of displaying architectural artifacts, as we have seen. Even if such attempts are epistemologically not without risks, as they tend to dissolve the critical distance between the subject and the object, and thus the precondition of knowledge and insight, they do have the power to create a memorable experience. As a matter of fact, alternative forms of display have been tested repeatedly to explore the conditions of the possibilities of viewing within the context of a museum. As my very last example, I would like to mention the exhibition Home Delivery from 2008, which you can see here. This show, again, using you know, the outdoor space of the museum and in short, uh, installing examples of real architecture, this show related to the tradition of the houses in the garden by presenting on a site adjacent to the museum a number of prefabricated houses and prefabricated construction, of course, being very important in the United States. However, the exhibition intelligently subverted the expectations of the viewers by leaving the houses completely empty devoid of any furniture. 
So instead of providing the visitors with a simulation of an interior, uh, sort of this voyeuristic uh, pleasure that we take in visiting other people's you know, places. Actually, uh, one of the big pastimes of Americans is actually to go you know, visiting house museums where you can sort of get an impression of how important or famous people or people in the past uh, inhabited their domestic spaces. So um, instead of providing that pleasure to visitors, the attention was actually redirected to the spatial and structural configuration of the houses the material of architecture itself. So the experience of visiting a furnished home was denied and replaced by a lesson on architectural construction. A playful lesson, obviously. Despite the pressures of the experience economy, the museum thus con con continues to be capable of providing a platform for a critical public discourse on architecture and the built space, or at least that is my hope. Thank you very much.